Hey everyone, in this episode, we will have a look at persisted queries in GraphQL and why you should consider using them in your setup. Before we get started, we are running workshops at NEC conferences throughout the year. So if you want to learn all about GraphQL in .NET or in combination with Relay and React, then head over to the NDC website and check out our workshops. Also, if you like our content, please hit the subscribe and like button below the video. And with that, let's dive into it. Before we talk about persisted queries, let's have a look at the standard a request response flow that we have in GraphQL. So typically when a GraphQL client application communicates with our backend, it will send a GraphQL request document over to our server. The server would then process this request document and send us back the response. There are two major issues that we have with that. First, it's about large requests. So when we send always the whole GraphQL request document, we are actually sending large requests over the wire every time we want to execute a certain request on the server. And have a look at this GraphQL request document. It doesn't even fit on two standard pages if you would print it out. And this is quite common with GraphQL since the GraphQL architecture allows us to write an optimized request that fetches all the data that I need for a certain web page or for a certain components. So I can fetch all the data in a single request. And the problem here is that we always have to send the request, although after deploying our client application to the cloud or to the mobile app marketplace, it will not change ever. The second issue here is about security. And that means with a GraphQL server that allows just to run any request possible on that GraphQL server, we also open us up to security vulnerabilities. We would have to think about a couple of things here, like query cost analysis and throttling requests or quotas for certain users to make sure that some external user does not craft a very, very large query that overwhelms our backend. Very early in the development in GraphQL, Facebook experienced this particular problem and started introducing a concept called persisted queries. With persisted queries, the client application would, on production build, export all the queries, hash them, and replace the queries in the client source code with the hash. These queries would then be stored on a persisted query store. Instead of sending the GraphQL request document every time, the client would now send the query ID or the query hash over the wire to the GraphQL server. The GraphQL server would then look up the GraphQL request document in the GraphQL persisted query store and execute that document and return the result. With this small change, we dramatically reduced the GraphQL request size. It's essentially now just the query ID and a couple of variables if we pass some along. But we also give our GraphQL server more capabilities to optimize this request because we no longer need to validate our request. At build time, we push that to the query store. It is one time validated by the server and then it just passes through no validation anymore. There are other optimizations that could happen. Like we could also generate on build time a query plan and pre-compute that before the, uh, the request is actually loaded into our GraphQL server. We also dramatically simplified how we can secure our server. Since now we can reject all the queries at production level that are not persisted queries. There's often an argument made so if we use persisted queries with GraphQL, we essentially made a REST service. And while there are some merits to this argument, essentially we have now a static server, it's important to reflect how we build that server. Because at development time, our front-end developers 
have all the flexibilities to build their interface for their application with our server. Ideally, everything is exposed on our server, even if the front end team does a major overhaul of, of the client application, we don't have to do anything on our backend. So essentially the client team has the full flexibility to craft their request. And after they deploy it, they have a fully optimized server that serves fully optimized requests. If you think of building such an optimized server with REST for each client iteration, you have to craft optimized requests for each and every component and application type you have. And this could add up if you think about uh, multiple app versions that you have deployed on multiple mobile devices and so on. But with GraphQL, it's just built into the development flow of your client applications. So let's have a look at how we can build that in with hot chocolate. So for this, let's head over to VS Code. And this is an empty application as of now. And what we're going to do is we do a .NET new GraphQL here. And that will generate an empty GraphQL server. So we have a basic query here that serves as a book and author example. And what we are going to do is put some persistent queries into this GraphQL server. But first, let's start it. So we do dot and watch. And then let's wait for it to come up. And then we will head over to Banana Cakebot. And I already can see here's my book title example I used earlier in the slides. And if I execute that, you can see we get a simple graph query response. So if we go over to Postman, we actually can see that the graph query request is not just the document. It's actually a JSON request where we package the graph query request document into a property called query. And you can see if I execute that here, I get the same response. So just that we understand how the transport really really works. Okay, let's go back to our GraphQL server. And what we want to do is configure it to run with persisted queries. So this is our current configuration here. We just have a GraphQL server and we just added a query type. So let me have another terminal blade here. And the first thing we will do is add another package and that's the hot chocolate persisted queries file system package. So it's, it adds a file system provider for persisted queries. There is also a Redis provider and you could have other providers there. So I added this package and now I can add the persisted query store to my GraphQL server. So let's do that. This is an add read only file system query store. I have specified that I have a folder called queries right in my root here. So let's add that. There's also a read write file system query store here, which is for automatic persisted queries. And I will do another episode on this one. So this time we only look at persisted queries. So with this, my GraphQL server has a persisted query store, but still couldn't run with persisted queries because we need a different pipeline to execute persisted queries. So in order to configure that in, we would do use persisted query pipeline, and now we could run persisted queries. But there's one thing missing, and that's because there is no persisted query. So let's add a persisted query document here, and we call that 12345.graphql. And then we put a standard query in here, fetch a book and the author's name. Okay, with that, we have a persisted query. Our GraphQL server is reloaded. Let's head over to Banana Cake Pop. First. So if we execute that query, it will just work because the persisted query pipeline doesn't prohibit us from using normal queries. But if we go to Postman and then craft a GET request that specifies the persisted query ID and execute that, we actually get the response to the request that is stored on our server. So persisted query do now work in our setup. Let's go back to VS Code. So persisted query works now, but we also want to profit from the security concerns like limiting our consumers to only use persisted queries. In order to do that, we would need to change our use persisted query pipeline. The best way to do that is to have a look at the 
persisted query pipeline, you can see what elements it has, and then replace the persisted query pipeline with our custom pipeline. So this is the standard persisted query pipeline as of now. And what we want to do is after use read persisted query pipeline, this is after we read the persisted query from the store or after we got it from the cache. So we have a two phase caching here. So first we look in the in memory cache of our chocolate. If a query is stored there, if it's not stored there, we would look into the persisted query store and fetch it from there. We do that to reduce IO. So the 100 most used queries are stored in our in-memory cache. This can be configured, by the way. You can have a larger or smaller in-memory cache. So after we have read that or after we have cached that, we want to determine if the query that is in our pipeline can be executed. So what we will do here is introduce a middleware. If you want to learn about middleware, there is a video on YouTube about middleware. I will put the link of the middleware episode into the video description. In our middleware, we want to execute a document if it's cached or a persisted document. This means either it is a persisted query, which comes directly from our persisted query store, or it was loaded from the persisted query store, but now reside in the in memory cache. Both is valid. So when Eyes of the state is true, we will execute our document. If it's not cached or persisted, we want to deny that. So we introduce an error here that the document is not a persisted query document and then craft a result from that error. Let me import the result builder here and then we could test that. So let's first go to Banana Cake Pop and execute our simple query here. And you can see only persisted queries are allowed. So then we can go to Postman and execute our persisted query. And you can see it works. Let's just grab the persisted query document and put that in Banana Cake Pop. And you can see I still can execute it because the server knows this exact document is actually a persisted query document. But we could also change this and make it more strict like we could go here to our condition and say we only want persisted queries so it's not allowed to provide a query document only a query id and if we now go back to banana cake pop and execute that we get an error even though this document is known to us but still in Postman, our persisted query works. There's one more trick. And that is, like, think about your developers. You maybe want to allow your developers to still run normal query documents on your GraphQL server, even on production, maybe just to test or whatever. So what we could do is introduce a HTTP request interceptor that injects a special attribute whenever a developer is logged in. So let's add that. So first we add the interceptor, this guy here, let's import that. And second, we will add the condition. So at, at this point, we wanna just try it out. So what I will do is, if there is a header admin set on our request, we will allow any query. If not, then the default behavior will take precedent and only persisted queries are allowed. Okay, let's do that. So if the admin header is set on our request, we will set some state on our request where we say admin true, just a cheap thing. If you do that in production or on your actual environment, put a scope on your token and then check if a developer scope is added to your token and then infer from that that it's actually a developer session and that non-persisted queries are allowed. Okay, for us, we are just doing it for demo, so a header is enough. And then we can change our condition here 
to also allow it if there is a global state key admin registered. One more thing before we test that. We created our custom request interceptor down here, but we also need to register it. So we do add request interceptor, custom request interceptor, and then we can head over to Banana Keg to try it out. And you can see here's already my request. And if I execute that, I get the message that only persists queries are allowed. But now we have integrated this header. So we could say we have an admin header here with the value one. We are not validating the value actually in a second. So we can just put anything in there and then execute that. And suddenly we get the request. So I'm now a developer. So I'm allowed to execute these requests, even though for standard requests, the server only allows persisted queries. That's a variation here. Awesome. This is how persisted queries work from a backend side. If you want to look up how it works on the client side, head over to your client framework. For instance, Relay has a guide here how to set up persisted queries. And the really good thing with Relay, why it's a double plus, is that it really removes the persisted queries from the client source code. So your bundle size also reduces quite a lot when you strip out queries from your client source code. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into persisted queries. It's a very simple concept to secure your GraphQL server. And think about it. There are just very few GraphQL servers that really need to fully expose their GraphQL backend to customers. One example is, for instance, the public GitHub API which allows you to query for issues, build extensions on top of GitHub. But most GraphQL servers are used to build internal clients or internal components for your company. In these cases, this is a very efficient way to make your GraphQL communication fast and secure. If you like our content, hit the like and subscribe button below the video. And don't forget to star our project on GitHub. With this. See you next time.